Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Nolutando Nematswerani. As usual, I'd like to welcome uh, people who are joining us for the first time. And for those who are returning, uh, wanting to hear more, uh, we welcome you back. So this is really on behalf of Discovery, SAMA, uh, UFFP and SAPPF. We've reinstated this new series uh, this year as part of the second wave. And tonight is our sixth webinar. This year, what we have been doing is really um, to salute, to remember and to honor our fallen heroes who are our clinicians who succumbed to COVID-19. We would like to pass our deepest condolences to their families. May their souls rest in peace. Tonight's webinar is really uh, going to be addressing the emergence and spread of the new SARS-CoV-2 variant um, that is now <laughs> referred elsewhere as the South African variant, but we know that uh, you know it, it's not supposed to be called by the by 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 the country of origin because it may have actually uh, come from from anywhere else. So I think um, we are really excited to welcome back um, a team of experts that have worked on this uh, particular, you know, in terms of discovering this new variant and reporting it to the world. I think it was groundbreaking work that was done um, locally. Um, just as, um, you know, as, as usual, some house rules, uh, please remember that this webinar is CPD accredited. Certificates take about a week to be ready. If you've got any queries, please uh, contact us on cpd at discovery.co.za. All webinars are made available uh, on the Discovery website under the tab for healthcare professionals. Please do feel free to ask questions as the presenters uh, present uh, their, their work. Um, please use the Q&A button for this uh, type of, 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 of service. Don't use the chat button. Um, uh, we usually are inundated with, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, questions, but we try to group them in themes and try and, and get the best in terms of asking our, our experts uh, during the talks. Um, and, and some of the questions we find that uh, they usually get answered uh, as the presenters present. So today we're welcoming back a very esteemed team of, of, of experts. Uh, Dr. Lessels was here before. He is a senior infectious diseases specialist at KwaZulu-Natal Research and Innovation Sequencing Platform, CRISP, in UKZN. He will be joined by Professor Tulio de Oliveira, uh, who is uh, also the director of the KwaZulu-Natal Research and Innovation Sequencing Platform, CRISP. Um, he is the research professor in the College of Health Sciences, UKZN, and the principal investigator of the Network for Genomic Surveillance uh, South Africa. Um, so we're really excited. I must say I enjoyed their talk last year. Uh, they came and presented uh, on the St. Augustine's uh, case study. I think uh, it was one of my best uh, presentations last year. So I'm really excited. No pressure, Dr. Lessels and Prof. Uh, so looking forward to hearing your, your great insights. Uh, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, I'm just trying to sort out to, to uh, get Tulio into the meeting because he's having a little bit of difficulty. Um, Renard, I don't know if you've managed to send a, a new link. Yeah, don't worry, Prof. Uh, I mean, sorry, don't worry, Dr. Lesels, we will get Prof on. Yeah, it's just it's just that he uh, is supposed to start the presentation, <laughs> so it would be uh, better if we can get him in somehow. Um, but maybe I will just start and and uh, then just interrupt me when when Tulio uh, arrives in the room and he will take over from me essentially. Thank you. So um, thanks for asking us again to, to talk at this, at this meeting. And uh, what we're going to talk about is this new variant that we called here in South Africa, 501YV2. And just kind of give you a little bit more uh, information about uh, what we found out. Obviously, a, a lot of people will have heard things about this uh, in other presentations. But just giving you a bit of an up-to-date 
sense of what we know about this now um, and what we still don't know about it. And we are presenting not, not just work uh, done by ourselves at, at CRISP, but actually this is work from a large number of people uh, across the country. Uh, and, and much of that is through what's called this Network for Genomic Surveillance in South Africa, NGSSA. And I see that Tulio has now managed to join. So he's going to take over from here and start the presentation. And then I will take over about halfway through. And we hope that we will uh, get through it enough that we have time for questions at the end. So Tulio, welcome. OK, thank you, Richard. Yeah, and, and, and sorry for my little technical difficulty, but, but that's fixed, yeah. So, so, so as Richard say, yeah, this is, this is really the work of almost all of our universities in the country. So we have WITS, we have UCT, we have Stellenbosch, University of the Free State, uh, UKZ, and NICD, NHLS, and ARI. So, so it's very excited that, that, that the whole country is working together to try to, to face this challenge, yeah. So, so if you go to the next slide, please, yeah. So that's something that we, we that genomics, and, and you may be aware or not, but it was a really, really useful tool, tool even a potent tool on the response to the COVID-19 epidemic. Yeah? So, so it was used to discover the virus associated with the disease, and, and that was very early. Yeah? For example, they, they, they only noticed the, this, this un, unusual cluster of pneumonia by 31st of December 2019. And by 11 of January 2020, they already had the, the genome of the virus, which they could identify what was the causative agent of that disease. Yeah. And then once you have the genome of the virus, you could develop diagnostics. For example, qPCR normally yeah, aim at three different genomic regions of the virus. So, so that's probes that trying to identify three different genes. Yeah. And then straight after that, they, they use the genome of the virus to, to, to create vaccines. Eh? Especially if the, the, the mRNA, that's the very potent vaccine, such as Pfizer and Moderna, but also the vector vaccines, they also use the genome of the virus to stimulate the immune system. Eh? One thing that we are, we are quite, uh, we like doing a lot is about tracking transmission. And, and you may be aware of our previous presentation of using yeah, genomics, but also like clinical detective work to understand outbreaks and how the virus is spread. We, we also have used it uh, to identify reinfection and Richard will bring more information about that. And also how the virus uh, interacts with, with the host, or so this means the human, yeah, on, on developing both disease, but also clinical symptoms. Yeah? So, so never we, we have produced as a scientific community so much genomes. So, so it's close, is over 600,000 genomes with, with around like 5% of those is from South Africa. But despite South Africa have contributed not with an extremely large number of genomes, yeah, our genome program have been considered one of the best in the world. And I'm gonna try to explain you, you why in the, next, in the next few slides, yeah. So, so if you go to the next slide, yeah, what we did there, uh, we, we, we knew that we didn't have the, the, the resources and the capacity, uh, especially in the labs to kind of generate hundreds of thousands of genomes. So what we did uh, very early in the pandemic, and that was around March and next year, we set up this uh, network of genomic surveillance. Yeah. And, and, and this was funded by the, the Department of Science and Innovation, the South African Medical Research Council. And then what we did is to set up five genomic labs, yeah? And, and you're gonna see here, on, on, for example, CRISP the, at the University of the Free State, at Stellenbosch, at UCT and the NICD. And what was important about these genomic labs that they, they, they sit in very close proximity with the NHLS lab. So the for, for, for sequencing was very, very uh, easy to do. And then what we decided to do is just to do a more pragmatic uh, approach that, for example, in KwaZulu-Natal, 
Every week for the past 52 weeks, we would sample 50 or 100 uh, random samples from different uh, facilities across the different district and keep following this virus over time. Yeah. And so, so on the left, that is a, is a paper that we published in the Lancet Microbe with both Kain Somi and Koleka. Miss, I always find it difficult to find her name. Yeah, Melissana. Yeah, that we show what was the power of putting together academic institute with the NHLS to track this virus in real time. Yeah. So if you go to the next slide. This is what, what, what we normally see. That's the two um, waves of infections, yeah. One thing that both uh, Richard and I, or at least I can talk to uh, my own opinions, yeah, is that people say that we, we cannot avoid a third wave. And, and I completely disagree. Yeah? If we do very good testing, contact tracing, and isolation, we can avoid a, a, a third wave, but, but is that basic public health response, yeah. But if you go back to this graphic on, on, on the blue, we have we have the cases, okay. In the black, we have the, the mortality that was that has been reported to COVID. But one thing that we know is that both of those is underestimated. What we know from, from uh, tests that sometimes we go up to 30% of positivity rate, but if you link that to the MRC uh, access, that's what, what a fantastic system that ran in South Africa, you know that in reality, our two waves was much, much bigger than our tests and reported that show. Huh? So what we are talking, we are talking about one of the most severe pandemics in the world there with close to 150,000 excess deaths. Eh? And you're going to see how much bigger was the second wave than the first one. Eh? And so if you put that in, if you normalize by population, it's 2,410 excess deaths per million population. And that would put us probably in the top 10 countries, if not the five one on excess deaths. Eh? So what we did from genomic surveillance is that we will follow like what is in the panel A in black, it is the, the, the cases, yeah. In red is they are not, so, so that's something that we use a lot to understand if the pandemic is going to be increasing and decrease. And that little blue bar in the bottom there is the genome that we generate over the, the course of the first wave, yeah. So what we could show on the first wave that we could understand where the virus come from. So around 80% of the, the introductions were from Europe. Yeah. And if one started digging into the data, you, you, it's not surprising given that 80% of the flights outside the, con the continent of Africa are from Europe. So normally introductions mimic very close the number of international flights. But what you see in the panel C, which is the introductions now is represented in black, it is that very early we are followed by, by localized transmission, which we estimate like 99%, or so if not 99.9% of our infections are transmission between people inside South Africa, some of the times by seeding by, by initial introductions from outside. So if you go to the next slide, that's something that, that people don't realize. But in reality, what we had in South Africa, we had like 20, 30, sometimes more than 30 different uh, lineages circulating at a given time. So what you can see here in the y-axis is, is the date of that we isolate the, the genomes. And, the, and in the x-axis, uh, thank you, Richard, and the y-axis is the, is the number of, of virus that, that associate with different lineages, yeah? So normally what we have is this completely like multiple, multiple lineages circulating in the first wave. And if you take one point, you can easily count 10 or 20 different lineages yeah, that were circulating. Yeah? And that was common around the world because this is the process of introductions by followed by localized transmission. Yeah. What we found yeah, is that we, we, we have seen all these variants, all these lineages, and 
then we got a very important hint, yeah, and that came from 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 private hospitals, yeah, more specific from the NetCare yeah, group from clinical teams in the Nelson Mandela Bay, that they were very concerned to see a very rapid resurgence of case and admission from October onwards. And, and as you are aware, most of you will be clinical staff. We are not expecting a second wave in the beginning of our summer. Yeah. And they were also concerned that some the clinical spectrum of this was different and they contact us, is this, is this a different strain? And, and that's why this kind of seminars and interaction between our basic science group and clinical staff is so important because a lot of times it is by this close context with the clinicians that we're gonna start understanding what's happened in the hospital. Eh? The, the initial hypothesis is, was that this was a, a variant that was introduced from Germany. Yeah, why Germany? Yeah, because they have this big uh, uh, auto, uh, automotive uh, 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 business in, in the Nelson Mandela Bay, but in the end it was not from Germany. But, but that was something that was different and that the clinicians were seeing something different in the ground, yeah. So if you go to the next slide, what we see, and just to ground you on the, uh, we have two different graphics there. The first one's on whole genomes. And what we are, what we are showing there in the, in the X axis, yeah, is the different variants or the different uh, lineage that we're co-circulating in South Africa. So at that we had three main lineages that they got numbers in the classification, the B154, B1.156 and, and C1. And these have a number of mutations that differentiate them from the original Wuhan strain. Eh? So normally it's between 10 and, and 14 mutations, that's the Y axis, yeah. And then what you see this new variant, it has almost the double of mutations, yeah. So, so either 20, 23, 25 mutation. What become more clear is that these mutations, they normally tend to be what you call amino acid change mutations. What does it mean? It means that when you have a mutation in the genome, change the amino acid of the protein, which normally is associated with a change on protein function. And the 501YV2 had the majority of the mutations were amino acid changing. You can see around 20. And the previous variants had around 10. So, so that was already quite strange. But what became more concerning is the location of these mutations. Yeah? They tend to cluster in the spike region, whereas our previous variants that were circulating in South Africa had either one or two mutations at the nucleotide level in the spike region, which normally only translate to one amino acid mutation. Our new variant had either seven or eight, and every single one of them were an amino acid change. So it is really high number of non-synonymous mutation or amino acid change mutations in the spike protein. Yeah. And then if we map that in the genome, so so that's is, is a very pretty picture of the genome is not drawn to, to the scale. The, the genome of the virus around 30,000 um, I mean, and nucleotides, the spike proteins around one and a half thousand. But what it show here, each of these little dots and lines yeah, is a mutation. So we normally have between 20 and 30 mutations in the genome, but as you're gonna see, they are highly concentrated in the spike protein. That's what we show in green. And then what we highlight in spike protein is some of the most important regions, yeah. In red, we have the, what you call the receptor binding domain. So this is probably the most important pro area of the protein and Richard's gonna get in very great details of that in, in, in the next few slides, yeah. And then in purple, we have the receptor binding motif. So our variant has three mutations in the receptor binding domain, which two of them in the receptor binding motif. One of them, the 501Y, is that what give name for our variant. V2, 
because the first major variant that have the 501Y mutation which associated with high transmissibility is the one in the UK. So we decided to call our one V2. But some of the mutation that we worry us the most is not the one that increased transmission, but the E484K, because this is the one that closely associated in many experiments with decrease of neutralization by both covalescent plasma, but potentially also by vaccines. And we're gonna get in more detail of that. We also worry about that constellation of mutations on the N-terminal domain. You can see that we have like six mutations plus a deletion because that's the second most important area of this protein, which is also affected by antibodies. So just to explain in a very simple um, term, what we have, we have the virus and then the most important protein is the pi is spike protein. So that's the protein that the virus will use to bind the ACE2 receptor in the human cell to, to really infect the cells, yeah? So not only this protein is very important, but also the receptor binding domain is what you're gonna see interacting with that green area which is exactly what it's really binds. So what we know about this variant is that they have a higher bind affinity, which create a better grip to enter the cells. But these regions are also affected by antibodies, yeah? So if you go to the next slide, and that's one of the very pretty protein structures from Cub Wilman on the end. That's normally how we look at the protein, yeah? So what we are mapping there in yellow is what we call the receptor binding domain. And we identify our three main mutations, the 501, the 417, the 484. And then in blue, it is what we call the N-terminal domain. So as you can see, these areas of the protein is highly exposed. And that's the areas that's gonna be targeted by neutralizing antibodies, yeah? So one th thing that we noticed quite early is that by all this constellation of mutations suggest of a virus that is a escape of neutralizing antibody, which, we, which got proven in the, in the last two months, yeah? So next slide, Richard, yeah. So, so that's the kind of things that, that, that I, I love doing, or our team, yeah, we're gonna try to ground you, yeah. So this is what we call a phylogenetic tree. And in red, it's sequenced from South Africa. So as you can see, and in the, in the y-axis there, it is the time of these samples when they were isolated from the patient. So that's basic when you as doctors and nurses you take out the swab, yeah? So what you see is that in South Africa, if you cross at a given time, let's say around August or something like that, you have almost the whole diversity of the world of variants or lineages circulating in South Africa. So what it means, it means that we didn't have one variant completely dominating, but we have these multiple, multiple hundreds, if not thousands of introductions that are causing infection until our 501Y, which will appear in, in October, November, and December. And again, if you cross there by December, you're gonna see that almost no other virus existed with exception of that variant. And there we are marking the three different um, lineages that were circulating at relatively high prevalence, the C1, the B156, the P B154, yeah. So in the next slide, what we're gonna see, it is how this phylogenetic tree look about variants around the world, yeah. So at the moment, we have many different variants, what you call variants of interest, but we have in reality three main variants of concern. So that's the variants that we think that either transmissible 
or they, they escape and neutralizing antibodies. And in red is the one from that was identified in South Africa. As I noticed in the beginning of the seminar, we don't even know if it originated from South Africa, but we know that was identified and went to dominate all the infections in South Africa. In yellow next to that, or in orange next to that, is what's called the P1 variant that was originally identified from travelers in Japan, but then they link back to, the, to Brazil, yeah? And these variants completely distinct from South Africa. That's why they, we see them in separate part of the tree, but it has very similar mutations, yeah? And then the other big variant of concern is what you call the B1.17 that was identified in, in initially in Kent, but it became the main dominant variant in the UK and in also in Europe, yeah. And that one, it seemed to be transmitted very fast, but we're gonna get in detail of that, yeah. So what can we do? With genomic surveillance and having such a, a strong network, one thing that we did when we are highlighted by the hospital yeah, in the NetCare hospital is that we went, what you can see all these white dots, we, we activate our network to sample dozens, if not hundreds of clinics close to where we think that variant has emerged, yeah? Which is in the Nelson Mandela Bay, yeah? So by using all the genomes and what you call phylogeography that analyzing the spread of these variants in space and time, we can really understand how it spread around the different areas, yeah? So what I show here is quite complicated, but just trying to explain to you, we have a, a, a basic legend that when it's blue, it's around August, September, 2020. And when it's red, it is like December, 2020 or January, 2021. So we can see this variant emerging the Nelson Mandela Bay, very early being introduced to a lot of different um, clinics in the area or, or districts. And then it go to an amplification event also in the garden route. And you're gonna understand that how the second wave started, start by the Nelson Mandela Bay and start moving southwest to, to, to Cape Town and northeast to KwaZulu Natal. And now we have almost a hundred thousand genomes. And unfortunately, South Africa is being completely dominated by this variant. Yeah. So that's what we will show in the next slide. And then to ground you in the X axis is the date of isolation of samples. In the Y axis is the proportion of the genomes. So we start our genomic surveillance very early in the last week of February of, of last year. And when I have white, it's what I show you in the beginning is in reality, I have 20, 30 different variants. So just not make this graphic busy. We are, we, we are presenting that in white. So around during the, 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 the level five and for lockdown of the first wave, we have the emergence of the first lineages in South Africa. As I mentioned, then three lineages tend to kind of co-dominate, but they never completely dominate the infections. They circulate between 10, 20% each. And then we have the emergence of the 501YV2 with completely almost dominated all the infections. And we start not seeing any more of the other variants, which come to prevalence very, very, very high, yeah. So if you go to the next slide, it's just a table that we show by month the number of sequence genomes that was generated and the number of the 501v2 variant. And then you're gonna see this is starting increasing on proportion from 10%, 11% to 94%. And in February, it's above 98%. So what it means, it means that almost every sequence or basic every sample that we sequence is the same variant, yeah. So if you go to the next slide, one thing that we worry, and Richard and I, we worry quite early, and we, what we did was to contact some of the neighboring Minister of Health, but also humanitarian agencies, uh, 
without bond because we did expect the variant as it was dominating South Africa. And we come to the end of the year where lots of migrant work to re, uh, come back to the country that would set a second wave and uh, very hard in the neighboring countries. And unfortunately, we saw that in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and, uh, uh, and Swatini, yeah. And that was quite extreme, this second wave in these countries because they haven't experienced really a, a big wave. And if you imagine that some of the data in South Africa of cases and deaths are not very accurate. So what we believe that in our neighboring countries in reality is a completely underestimation. And we know that in some of them was an absolute catastrophe, especially Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Eswatini where, where they ran out of beds very, very early, yeah. So what we did here as part of our national consortium is working with the Instituto Nacional de Saúde, that would be our DOH in South Africa, what in Mozambique go by the acronym of INS, to start receiving samples of them every, every few weeks to determine the variants that were circulating. And so we confirm our suspicious, and that's what we show in that phylogenetic tree. The X axis is time. The, the purple dots is some of the first sequence that we saw in Mozambique. So what we saw, it is dozens of introductions, probably hundreds of thousands. We are sampling a very small number. But what we worry and what we see there in that arrows is that very early localized transmission yeah, of our variant, which we truly believe that became the main prevalent mm. variant in Mozambique, less, less uh, analysis was close to 80%, which caused the massive second wave in that country. And this variant is identical with the South Africa and share either eight or nine of the spike mutations. Yeah. So if you go to the next slide, yeah. Unfortunately, this virus travel very well around the world. At the moment, have been identified in 46 countries, yeah, which it is uh, dominating local transmission in a lot of our neighboring countries. But it also have been introduced in multiple times and already localized transmission to Europe, more specific, the UK, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, Germany, North America, uh, Canada and have multiple times been introducing to Asia. One of the reasons why we don't normally see black dots in Asia and Southeast Asia or Shenye, because they are really good at killing these introductions. And so as they are introduced, they have this very serious uh, isolation of returning uh, travelers or, or travelers to, to the country which normally allow that variants not to continuous transmission on, on them. So if you go to the next slide, yeah, that I'm gonna pass to my clinician scientist, Richard, which will be able to explain much better to you what we have learned about the function significance and the mutations of this variant. Yeah, thank you, Richard, yeah. Thank you. So I think Tulio has explained clearly what, what, we, what we know about um, this variant emerging and, and spreading in South Africa. And what he showed you very clearly is how this uh, variant uh, displaced all the other viruses that were spreading in different parts of the country and really became the dominant uh, virus that was spreading where, wherever we were uh, doing the genomic sampling. And so that uh, tells us that this virus has some evolutionary advantage over the other viruses. And one of the things we've been doing uh, since detecting this in kind of end of November, early December, is just understanding that. So understanding that in the laboratory and then in human studies and, and to understand more about um, which of these mutations are changing the function of the virus and, and the behavior of the virus.
And as we said at the beginning, that's not uh, work of our own, just that's actually many, many groups around the country uh, working collaboratively and bringing a lot of different expertise. And often that expertise is from research and, and uh, work on other viruses, particularly HIV or other pathogens such as TB, um, and really harnessing that expertise uh, to help us understand this virus and this variant. So I'm just going to briefly touch on a few of the things that we've that we now know about this, this variant, um, but also highlight that there's still a lot we don't know. And actually understanding uh, takes time and is not always as easy as, as you think to, to kind of rapidly get a sense of how this variant is behaving. So I think one of the things Tullio highlighted was um, that one of the early things that, that worried him when he first saw this genomic data were, were all these mutations in the spike protein. And then once we started to delve into that and understand that many of those mutations were actually at very important sites for the binding of the spike protein to the ACE2 receptor. And it became clear as, as we looked at work from around the world, and then as people started to do more work uh, to understand these mutations, it's clear that um, these mutations do cause significant change in the spike protein, significant conformational change. So they change the shape of that protein. And they do that in a way that strengthens the binding to the, to the cellular receptor. But they also do that in a way that then makes it more difficult for the neutralizing antibodies to bind and to block that interaction with the ACE2 receptor. And that's what Tullio was talking about in uh, thinking about the effect of these mutations. So one of the first questions um, was um, if the virus can enter the cells more easily, does that mean that the virus is more transmissible? So um, does it mean that somebody who's infected with the virus may be more infectious to other people? Or alternatively, some, does it mean that uh, as someone who's susceptible to the virus, that I'm more susceptible to it because the virus can hook on to my receptors more easily. So, so both of these things could explain how the virus would spread more efficiently in the population. And the thinking initially was that this virus was more transmissible. And, and that came because a lot of what we were learning was also about the variant that was first detected in the UK and had this common mutation, the 501Y. Um, and what was seen there was clearly how that variant was more transmissible in the UK, how it was spreading more efficiently. And here you just see some results from a mathematical model uh, that was done uh, by a team at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine in collaboration with SASIMA, the, the South African modeling group. And here from their, from their model, they estimated that that the variant here was also around 50% more transmissible than the viruses that had been circulating previously. But one of the things they were also able to model is to look at what would be the effect, not if it spread more easily from person to person, but if it was able to reinfect people uh, who had been previously infected and who we would assume would for now be immune to reinfection. And they could show that actually the same effect could be explained if this variant was able to evade around 20% of previously acquired immunity. So what that means is if roughly 20% of people who had been previously infected were getting reinfected, then this could also explain uh, how this variant was spreading so much 
uh, more efficiently and how it was uh, displacing all the other viruses. This is just an analysis done by some collaborators of ours from Switzerland. And here they can do some modeling just with the genomic data. So just looking at all that genomic data that Tulio showed and, and the different lineages of the virus. And again, with this, they showed that around this, this variant seems to be around 50% or possibly a little bit more uh, transmissible than the other viruses that were circulating. But again, this analysis doesn't consider uh, the immune escape properties of the virus. So to understand this potential that this virus could reinfect people, one of the things that we did was in the laboratory to work with some uh, collaborators here in Durban, and that's Alex Sigal and his laboratory at the Africa Health Research Institute, and also Yunus Musa at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And what we were able to do was by combining uh, all the genomic data with some data that they had from a cohort study at King Edward Hospital in Durban, where they had been following a cohort of people infected in the first wave and studying their immune responses to the virus. So what that meant was that we had um, viruses from people infected in the first wave, we had viruses from people infected with the new variant, and we had plasma samples from people that were infected with, with the first wave viruses. And so in the laboratory, what, what Alex's team were able to do is to look and see whether the plasma from, from people infected in the first wave was able to neutralize the 501YV2. And this is complicated work that requires growing the virus in a, in a very biosecure laboratory. And, and we're lucky that we have that capacity here in South Africa, again, that's been built up for HIV and TB work. And here is just the kind of key results from their experiments. Um, here on, on the left, I'm showing you what happens when you expose one of the first wave viruses to plasma from lots of different individuals infected in that first wave. And here, what you're showing is that um, as, as, as you have very concentrated plasma, uh, you, you get a lot of neutralization of the virus. So you neutralize most of the virus in, in, in vitro. And obviously, as you get more dilute plasma, uh, that changes. But what you see here with the 501YV2 virus is that no matter how concentrated the plasma is, you're getting very little neutralization of the virus. So essentially, neutralization of the of the 501YV2 is very strongly attenuated. So you need much, much more concentrated plasma to neutralize the virus than you do if you're neutralizing one of the earlier first wave viruses. So that's the laboratory, but that doesn't tell us what happens in reality and inside the human body. And so, one thing we've been trying to get a handle on is how many reinfections have really been happening and to what extent did reinfection of, of people drive that second wave. And the reality is we still don't know and we still don't have an accurate sense of that. What we do know, and many of you on the call will I'm sure have seen cases, we know that reinfections have happened. And, and we've been able, as Tulio said at the beginning, through the genomic sequencing, we've been able to confirm some of those reinfections to show clearly that people were infected with one virus and then reinfected with the 501YV2 a few months later. 
but that's not surprising because we've seen reinfections around the world and we expect that as people's immunity wanes, um, some people will be prone to getting reinfected. So in itself, that doesn't tell you that the virus is breaking through the natural immunity. So you have to look on a bigger scale. And when uh, the modeling team and the epidemiologists at the NICD look at the data, uh, they can look at the routine data and try and match up uh, people's infections and, and see how many um, putative reinfections are there. So basically two positive PCR tests in the system at least 90 days apart. And they've identified around 5,000 putative reinfections. And they're still busy working through that data to try and understand how many of those have, have good evidence to suggest that they are reinfections and not persistent infections. And then to try and understand how that contributed to the second wave. Maybe the best evidence that we have is some data that you many of you will have seen presented by Professor Madi from the Novavax trial. And they were able to look at reinfections because um, they did antibody testing at enrollment to the trial. And so in the placebo arm, so the people that had no vaccine, they could look at the rate of infection in those who were antibody positive, so had presumably been infected previously, and those who were antibody negative. And they showed that that rate of infection was essentially the same. So suggesting that that prior infection was not protecting people from getting infected again while they were being followed up in that trial. And Obviously, we need to see more of that data and to understand that data better. But I think that's the strongest data we have that does suggest that um, the 501YV2 is able to, to reinfect and cause quite a significant rate of reinfection. But at the moment, we're trying to gather a lot more of this similar data from some of the other vaccine trials and from some other good cohort studies, particularly cohorts of healthcare workers, um, to try and understand the extent of, of the risk of reinfection. So you'll remember when Tulio talked about how we first uh, started investigating and detecting this variant, one of the reasons for it was there was this concern about the start of the second wave or the resurgence in, in hospital admissions in the Eastern Cape. And there was a sense that the disease profile was different. And, and you'll remember Minister Mkhizi talking initially how uh, clinicians were noticing that there were sicker, younger people um, in the hospitals or in their clinics. Um, and also we're seeing possibly more rapid progression of, of disease in some people. And so again, that's been a key thing to try and understand. And again, we're working with imperfect data and trying to piece together different pieces of evidence. But here I'm just showing you some data from the NICD, from the DATCOV team. And this is led by Wasila Jassat at the NICD. And here they've looked at um, the profile of hospital admissions in some of the, the, the metros that were involved early in the second wave. So Nelson Mandela Bay, city of Cape Town, Etequini. And here we're just looking at the profile of admissions and the age profile of admissions. And essentially what they're showing here is that the age profile remained the same in the first wave and the second wave. So what you were seeing was just more admissions and a more rapid rise in admissions, but the, the kind of spread across the different age groups was essentially the same. And then when they look at the outcomes and look at mortality, again, there were some differences in mortality between the first and the second wave, but what they're able to do is to adjust for various factors. So adjust for the, 
the kind of comorbidities and the, and the patient related factors, but also to adjust for the kind of intensity of the of the admissions. So, so the kind of speed at which admissions were, were happening in the first and the second waves. And based on this analysis, again, in these three key metros, after making these adjustments, they saw that there was no significant difference in the in-hospital mortality between the first and second waves. One of the other teams that's done a very similar analysis is Marianne Davies and Andrew Bull with the, with the Department of Health in the Western Cape. And their preliminary findings were very similar, that once you adjusted for the kind of rate of increase in, in admissions, that there was no clear difference in the mortality. But one thing you'll notice here is that this was still quite early, this analysis, and it's while the second wave was still happening. And obviously, the deaths accumulate over time. And so one thing that both Wasila and Marianne are busy with at the moment is updating this analysis now that we're kind of exiting the, the second wave and have more complete data from the second wave. And I think we're waiting to, to, to see that data to see whether there's any change in, in uh, their findings relating to the, to the outcomes. One of the key questions, once we understood about the potential for this variant to escape the natural immunity, clearly the next question was, what about vaccine-induced immunity? Can this variant also escape uh, the immunity that's elicited uh, by the different vaccines? And you will all be aware that, again, uh, Professor Mahdi presented these results a few weeks ago uh, from his phase 1b2 trial of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And what this showed was that, unfortunately, uh, the variant does seem to be able to break through that vaccine-induced immunity. And what you're seeing here is just the main Kaplan-Meier curve for that trial, where uh, the pink line is the placebo arm, the blue line is the vaccine uh, participants. And what you saw here was that, unfortunately, almost as many uh, vaccine uh, recipients uh, developed mild to moderate disease as the people that received placebo. And they could show, again, through collaborating with, with uh, our group at, at CRISP and the NICD, who were able to sequence the viruses that were causing these infections, we could show that almost all of these infections were due to the new variant. So you'll all be aware of this data that, that suggested that this, the, it, the, there was really very little efficacy of this vaccine uh, against symptomatic COVID. But one of the key things that was highlighted was that because this was a phase 1b2 trial with a relatively small number of participants, um, this was only capturing mild to moderate disease. And there were, there were no severe cases of disease or, or deaths. And so it was very, it was not possible to look at the efficacy against severe disease. This slide is just showing again, the kind of connection between the lab work and the clinical trial evidence. And this is just showing that what you saw there in the clinical trial um, is explained in the laboratory or vice versa, that what you were seeing was that the plasma from the people that had received the vaccine uh, was not able to neutralize the new variant nearly as well. And this was shown in different experiments with the live virus and also by Penny Moore's group at the NICD with what's called a pseudovirus assay. Um, and showing clearly that, again, the neutralization was strongly attenuated. But 
the AstraZeneca, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine was not the only trial that was done here in South Africa. And you will all be aware there was also a trial of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and that's the vaccine that's now being rolled out amongst healthcare workers. And this was a bigger trial and a phase three trial. And so it had the numbers and it had the design to look not just at the mild and moderate disease, but also at severe disease. And it just so happened that these trials were enrolling and, and following up people as this new variant was taking over. And this is very uh, kind of hot off the press data, the, the actual numbers uh, that were released yesterday, essentially uh, in preparation for this vaccine being discussed tomorrow by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. And that's where it gets a rigorous evaluation. Um, and so they presented all the data and released this data yesterday. And that allows us to look at what the efficacy was, uh, specifically in the South African participants and with the different categories of disease. And so what I want to highlight here is that um, this vaccine is showing good efficacy, very good efficacy against severe and critical disease. You've got two figures here because they looked at two different analyses, either looking at disease that was occurring at least 14 days after receipt of the vaccine or after at least 28 days receipt of the vaccine. And, and so what you see here is an efficacy of around 73% against severe or critical disease. And the most important thing uh, was that in this study, there were seven COVID deaths. All of those deaths were in South Africa. So this was a trial that was happening in, in many different countries, but all of those COVID deaths were in South Africa and all of them were in the placebo arm. And there was no death in the vaccine arm, suggesting that there's a very strong protection against severe critical disease and ultimately death. And again, what we saw here was that almost all of the viruses infecting people in this trial were the 501YV2. So this is telling us how this vaccine works against this variant, not against other circulating viruses. So this is hugely reassuring data, is it, it, looking at the, the efficacy against the, the more severe end of the spectrum. So just to summarize in terms of what we know and what we don't know about the, the kind of functional significance of this variant and the behavior of this variant. So as we've explained, the genomic data strongly suggests that this variant was able to spread more efficiently in the population. It's still unclear to what extent that's related to an inherent increased transmissibility, so the virus spreading more easily from person to person, and how much it is this immune escape property and this ability to break through the natural immunity from prior infection. There's no clear evidence that the variant is associated with increased severity of disease or worse outcomes. But that analysis is difficult, and this remains an open question. And as I explained to you, we are going to see some updated analysis on that, and we may, we may yet see a, a different uh, conclusion on that. There's evidence to suggest that the variant is associated with reduced efficacy of some vaccines for mild to moderate disease. But where we have the evidence, the vaccine efficacy against severe and critical disease, and especially death, remains extremely high. And so just to conclude really both my section and Tulio's section, I think 
we've seen here in South Africa that genomic surveillance is a really important component of the public health response to a, to a virus pandemic. And it's important that that's coordinated uh, internationally and, and across the, the African region. And we've shown that by how we can detect this new variant and track how that's spreading now across the region and across the world. It's hugely important for that genomic surveillance, not just to happen in isolation, but to be linked well to people on the ground, to clinicians on the ground, to the public health teams on the ground, so that the genomic surveillance can be useful to guide what's happening in the pandemic response. So to respond to outbreaks, to respond to uh, resurgences of cases in specific areas. And that's going to be critical as we've exited this second wave and as we're monitoring to see whether there's a resurgence. It's again going to be critical that we get alerted if there's any unusual resurgence of disease activity in any location around the country so that we can then very rapidly respond and, and look at the genomes from those infecting viruses. And it's also important to link the genomic surveillance to other research that's able essentially to what we call link the genotype to the phenotype. So it's critical to have those clinical trials running, to have good cohort studies running, and to have the capacity to do the kind of laboratory experiments that help you to characterize the phenotype of the virus. And we're very lucky here in South Africa, as we've explained, that we have these multiple research groups around the country that have that expertise and that have helped to really do that. And I, and I think what we've seen here is that the science in South Africa is not just, of course, of use to us here in South Africa, but is, is of global significance and is helping the world in, in the response to this pandemic. So I'm going to close there for both of us and just highlight, and this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just some of the key people involved with the network for genomic surveillance and that have supported um, the work that we're describing here to you. So I'm going to finish and, and thank you very much and hope that we've left some time for questions. Well, wow, thanks once again, Dr. Lessels, uh, Prof. Tulia. You know, it's always great to listen to you and to, to gain such great insights. So we, we are a bit out of time, but I think there are some, some important questions that I'd like to pose. The first question is, uh, why the Nelson Mandela Bay? Why do we think um, the variant started there? Um, there's also been some comments around, you know, our HIV prevalence and, you know, the emergence of variants, maybe a comment on that. And the other piece is around uh, how we think, uh, you know, vaccines will work, uh, considering that, you know, uh, antibodies seem not to, to, to be very effective in neutralizing uh, uh, the, the, the variants. So I think maybe let me give you those three questions to try and answer for us. Julia, do you want to start with the how and why it emerged, and then I can answer the other. Okay, so so. And maybe sorry, um, Prof. As you as you address that, there's also the, the the issue around lockdowns. Do lockdowns actually make it worse for us in terms of the emergence of variants? So I think in that in that 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 answer should just encompass a, all that. Thanks. Okay, so so. so. So the first question, yeah, why why Nelson Mandela Bay? Yeah. <laughs> and a easy way to answer that's like is why not Nelson Mandela Bay? Okay, so 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 honestly we don't know where this these variants emerge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As we we put more data together across the world and with the different variants that emerge. At the moment, we, we, we have two main hypotheses, yeah. The first one, it is that these variants emerge in immunocompromised individuals. So for example, uh, patients in long-term um, cancer treatment, yeah, and, and, and that's because that they have, for example, immune system that are not very strong. 
the reason for that hypothesis is because they have finding such patients both in Boston in the US and in Cambridge in the UK that, that they, they have been for a long time infected with low immune system and they develop similar mutations, yeah. So, so, so that's one, one hypothesis and that's the one that we, we, we highlight in our paper as the UK immune compromised individual driving the, the evolution of the virus. But in the last um, month or so, or two months, it also came a second hypothesis that, that also have to be tested. To be honest, we is that uh, areas that had a very severe first wave, yeah, which it means many individuals infected, when, when come the second wave, they would have many individuals with lower, uh, lower level of or decreasing level of antibodies. And when exposed to, to the variants, to, to new virus, could, could help to select the escape mutant. And, and the reason of that hypothesis is because these variants have emerged uh, both in, in Brazil, in Manaus, which, which with some serology have uh, identified the attack rate of up to 75%. We know that Nelson Mandela Bay was some of the worst hitted areas in the country, especially if one uh, take the data from mortality mm -hmm. data. And also in London, that was quite 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 highly affected so the reality is that this is this this is just hypothesis that may even be difficult to prove because very difficult to go to patients zero yeah and as you are aware even the who sent the whole delegation to china in the last few weeks and and, and very difficult sometimes to to look to the source the main person take home message is that maybe may not even be that important to understand how it emerged, but just to learn that if we keep this virus circulating for so long at a relatively high level, it gives the chance to develop mutations that, that can allow escape from neutralizing antibody or also become more transmitted. Yeah, I don't know if Richard want to, to, to add to that. Yeah, so what I just try and and so some of the other things. I mean, I think what, in terms of the question around HIV, it's it's a question that we are still asking. Certainly, as Tulio mentioned, one theory was about um, this this possibility that people who were immunosuppressed might have a persistent infection, and that the virus might evolve inside that that person and then spread to other people. We have some data on how the immune response to the virus differs in HIV positive and negative people, and there clearly are differences, but we haven't got any data that really suggests that HIV positive people are having very prolonged um, SARS-CoV-2 infections and that the virus is, is evolving significantly. So we, we we, we just don't know, we don't have the data at the moment to really understand whether HIV might be a factor that's that's contributed to this. In terms of the vaccines, I, I, I think it's clearly a complicated area. One of the things that's clear is that what we're showing you here and what we're presenting in terms of the laboratory is neutralization data. And what this is telling you is what's happening to those neutralizing antibodies and, and how well did they neutralize the virus. But we know that's only one part of the immune response elicited by vaccines. And the, one of the problems is that the T cells, which are clearly also important, the, the work in the laboratory to look at T cells is much more complicated. You can't do it quickly and easily. You need different samples, you need more complex assays. And so we, we still don't have a good understanding um, of, to, of what extent these mutations in the variant affect the T cell induced immunity. But I think what we see in the clinical data is, is is making it plausible that the T cell response is still active. It's still strong against this variant. And that's what's mediating the clinical disease. So when we're seeing in, the, in that phase three trial, 
that the vaccine still has very good efficacy against the more severe end of the spectrum. That is plausibly that's telling us that the T cells are still active against the variant. And that's really important because essentially that's what the primary aim is now of the vaccination program is to reduce that very severe end of the spectrum of people that get very sick, that need hospitalized, that need intensive care, and that die. And, and the aim is to reduce that, 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 that happening if the uh, epidemic resurges again. Thank on the so question much. about, yes, I was just going to quickly just on the question of lockdowns and, and whether they uh, kind of promote the emergence of variants, I, I don't quite understand the mechanism by, by which that would happen. I think what Tulio has, has explained to you is that this virus evolution happens if the virus is spreading. If the virus is not spreading, then it's not evolving it can't evolve. It needs to pass between hosts to evolve. Lockdowns are, as we've seen, are just a crude instrument to interrupt transmission. So there's no plausible mechanism by which lockdowns in themselves would promote the emergence of, of new variants. Thank you so very much. I can see people are, are leaving. Um, if in a second, uh, maybe Prof, uh, you could just tell us how do we prevent the third wave because we don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> how we prevent the third wave? It, it, it's quite simple. Yeah, it is. It, it it's about basic public health response. Yeah, a lot of time we 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 want the magic bullet to come. But 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 in reality, it is about just doing doing the basics of uh, accurate testing, yeah, quick testing, identification of positive individuals, isolating the positives, quarantine the contacts, yeah, and 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 take the and take the basic measures of of uh, social distance, masking, and and. And, and, and sanitation. I, I, I personally don't believe that it's impossible to avoid a third wave, yeah. But, but if we don't do nothing, yeah, or if we do a, a job not well done, then, then we're not gonna avoid the third wave and neither yeah. a fourth wave. When, one interesting thing that's coming from, from some of the countries that have um, increased vaccination very fast is that they see not only a decrease on hospitalization and that, but a potentially decrease in, in transmission. It's very early to say. So, so I think that we, we, we just need to, to take quite serious our basic public health measures and also increase vaccination. If it's not to stop transmission, at least to avoid hospitalization and, and, and that, yeah. And and I'm I, I find quite sad that people think that they cannot do anything to avoid that. I don't know if Richard agree with me. <laughs> oh, completely. I think there are Thank things you. we can do and should do. Yeah. Thank you so so much. Just for the participants before you leave, please. Um, there's a poll that would like you to just complete for us, just to give us some feedback in terms of how you experience the webinar. To our esteemed guests, our experts here, we just want to thank you for you know sharing uh, these uh, these insights around this variant. As we continue to learn, we'll keep inviting you back so that we can be better educated. But thank you once again for taking the time. We really appreciate you, and we appreciate what you've shared uh, with us today. And I agree with Prof and Dr. Richard uh, Lessels. We are not helpless. Thank you so much. Have an awesome evening. Good night. Thank you.